Hello everyone, welcome to the first installment in our Disney Bible Studies. We're going to be discussing today a requested, and I am very thankful for the fact of this as being the case, the first Disney film to which, at least in my experience, had direct biblical parallels in its ties to the gospel and definitely a childhood favorite of mine, The Lion King. Now I'm sure you guys are so shocked if you haven't read the title already or clicked on this video without knowing what you were in for with Bible study and Disney and the title of the movie, it's totally catching you off guard. So let me do you the favor of pulling you back to earth and we will just start with the first words in this title in Bible study. We will get into the topics that are not only active illustrations and symbols of the gospel, but exactly where I'm coming from and walking through these things with you. So no thought or intent or in-depth research needs to be done on your part here. I'm going to lay out the facts and you can just use your ears. I'll be the one using my mouth. So if you'd like to join us, I greatly and very uh, eagerly welcome you to join us in this study and in regarding any future discussions you want to have about Disney films that you think may have blatantly obvious or sometimes maybe requiring more in-depth research in regarding topics of Disney or any other mode of entertainment. We started with My Little Pony. We continued with anime. Nothing's going to be limited to us because nothing can stop our God or the going out of his word. So if you want us to discuss other themes, no, the comment section is open for just such requests, i.e. the beginning of these studies. But regarding the topic at hand, the movie The Lion King, a very old and making me feel old to the fact it actually premiered in the same year that I was born. It contains a lot of biblical themes. I'd like to start with the most obvious. If you could turn to the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, if you have a physical copy, or if you're just going off of chronological, just type it in. And remember, it's one revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to read to you a passage out of chapter 5, and I'll start at the first verse. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept, John speaking, much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, referring to the Messianic lineage of Jesus Christ, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, Revelation 4 discussed this being the centerpieces around God's throne, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Translations also render this as slaughtered. It wasn't in good shape. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Again, horns being symbols of power and eyes, representations of knowledge, the seven spirits of the Lord, a reference to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. This being the last chapter of the Bible, it's a good idea to have read the other 65 before it. But this all being pointed out to you and my job to do that homework for you. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And the subsequent and following chapters include them worshiping Jesus for being able to redeem the earth. Now, what does this all have to do with the Lion King? These biblical prophecies and allusions and symbolisms to who Jesus is in the spiritual realm having seven or a complete absolute power, seven days in a week, seven notes in a scale, seven colors in the rainbow. Seven is a number that always implies totality. So Jesus has absolute power, absolute knowledge, and that knowledge is actually in reflection to God's heart and character. He is God incarnate. But with all of these things tying back to the topic at hand and making sure I don't lose you, I'd first like to walk you through what the Bible has been discussing thus far and firstly going through the plot line of The Lion King before we actually get into the gospel message. Now, The Lion King begins with a king, like most stories about a king would, named Mufasa, who rules his pride while preparing his son to continue the dynasty. Scar, Mufasa's malevolent brother, pl 
plots to overthrow him by surrounding himself with hyenas, who are presented as very selfish, self-destructive, and self-serving creatures. And they support Scar based off of its promises alone, not his results. There was a big music number to describe it. We all remember. After killing his brother in the tragic stampede, and deceiving Simba into thinking it was his fault, he leaves the nation and is taken in and raised by two characters I'm sure you all are familiar with, Timon and Pumbaa, a small and manipulative meerkat and a lovable but gassy boar. And he lives life according to a philosophy and phrase I don't think I need to say out loud, but I will later on, until Nala, his childhood friend and soon-to-be bride, gives him reason to return and take back his father's crown. After overthrowing Scar and taking back his pride, Simba rules with Mufasa's spirit, bringing back peace and plenty to his kingdom once again. I wrote this all down so I wouldn't get sidetracked after rabbit trails and such. But doing you guys the favor of taking notes in advance, I'd now like to read to you, in a sense, the gospel message in the entirety of the Bible leading up to this point in Revelation. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, first verse, first chapter, first book of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth. But being a God whose nature is love, wasn't content to simply create a universe of unending beauty to reflect himself or just to have angelic creatures to serve him. He created mankind, and deliberately so, with the unique opportunity to receive and enjoy a relationship with him, to be an active demonstration as well as a recipient of God's love. But love is not a forced policy and therefore requires free will even on the part of the angels. And just a side note here, even regarding angels, Satan for example, his job and his role as the worship leader in heaven did not change. He brings more glory to God than anyone else by providing a contrast. But note, because of his choices, his decisions, his role in the relationship, Instead of being a blessing to worship and glorify and point us all to God, he now serves as the antithesis by glorifying God even more by showing just how awful a future is for those who don't put their trust in God, who don't want a relationship with him. So, again, that point being made. Mankind was given two choices to choose or reject a relationship with God. And when we chose to reject our relationship with God, we brought death on all of creation as a result because when the title deed of creation, the authority over all the universe that God gave to man, was passed and handed down to man, this title deed, the scroll with the writings both in and outside that was talked about earlier in chapter 5 and verse 1, this was handed to us, but then when Satan came to us in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, which I'll read to you here in a moment, we obeyed him and thus became subservient to him. So, i.e., all authority that we had went to him and the universe has been spiraling out of control and in a state of decay, death, and chaos ever since. Note, it still bears some semblance to the beauty, the perfection, the order, the circle of life, and uh, little bits of Akuna Matata here and there, but as a whole, under the authority and dictatorship of Satan, who will be later illustrating back to Scar, it wasn't in good shape, and isn't to this day. You don't need a seminary degree to point that out. But in Romans 6 and verse 16, it actually points this out to us. Do you not know that whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or obedience leading to righteousness. So if we serve God, it's only making us more like him. If we serve Satan, it's only bringing us closer to where he's headed. So as uh, Craig Groeschel said in his book, Alter Ego, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. This philosophy shows to be consistent with biblical truth. So after mankind chose to reject God and Scar is essentially on the throne, God began a process with Adam and Eve to begin having children, and one of which would restore mankind's relationship with God, but in a way that was offered and consistent with God's heart. And just like when he first gave it to us, and who better to make sure this all went according to plan than God himself? Jesus is God incarnate. That's why Matthew refers to him as Emmanuel, our God with us, but Luke refers to him as Jesus. God has become our salvation, Yahushua, 
or Yeshua in Hebrew. So this restoration process and all of these things being put into place, we find that historically recorded in scripture there were two groups of people that were not only the providers, the progenitors, the patriarchs of this man who would bring salvation to all of mankind, but also myself being a part of the second group today, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who Jacob, by the way, means cheater, usurper, manipulator, one who catches by the heel, an illustration of a certain meerkat, and as well, the Gentiles, those who are part of the church, the bride of Christ, as they are called, those who have been redeemed by God by believing in God's promise and knowing that they are loved by him. And then at the end of the age, the book of Revelation discusses this, as well as many prophecies throughout the Old Testament, we read how God will restore mankind by physically completing what he accomplished spiritually on the cross, by dying and leaving us for a time until rule, uh, returning to rule us rightly. Now, all of these things being pointed out to you, if you can follow along enough with the similitudes, you are probably catching bits and pieces here and there, but I want to make sure nothing's left to the imagination, and I want to give you nine examples. There are others, but I just want to point out nine, six of which I'll expound in detail, of biblical illustrations, Christian and inspired themes that tie these things back to Christ himself, but most of all and most importantly, and the very reason we are doing these studies isn't just to point out like, oh, isn't that neat, and oh, that's something worth considering, but to actually give you a reason to love these things even more. Because it's one thing to be entertained by something and then get bored of it after the 90 to 125 minutes have passed. But it's another thing entirely to be able to take these things after you have, been, you have uh, taken the time to retain them into your eyes, ears, and other senses and actually apply them to something worthwhile, something eternal, to take what could be just an idol to waste time and actually make it into a tool to worship God, to bring you closer to his heart. Because I actually was asked by a friend recently who said, do you think God approves of such and such, like this hobby? I mean, there's lots of violence, there's lots of war, there's lots of all these different things. And you just really have to take into consideration, God approves of anything as long as it brings you closer to his heart. There's naturally obvious examples of things that, no matter how you use, view, or participate in them, don't lead you to closer to God in any way, shape, or form other than a demonstration of his mercy and also the opportunity to show in his life, in your life, his power by restoring and forgiving you of such actions. But there's also other things that we would be considered neutral. And I don't want to settle for having things that are, in a sense, just wasting time in my life. I want to bring everything before God's throne and seeing what he can bless and use. So we're going to discuss these nine themes, and I hope that you can not only catch on, but apply this into future messages and the things that entertain you as well, and perhaps even start your own ministry and sharing things that God has, in a sense, brought into your mind's eye for more than just one reason than taking up an hour of your time. So, the first example we're going to talk about is Scar. And Scar, obviously, as mentioned before, is a good illustration and similitude to Satan, a false king that through lies took over a crown that belonged to the one he convinced to give it up to him. The book of Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 through 5 regarding the incident in the Garden of Eden. You guys are all familiar with the story. The passage says this, The woman said to the serpent when he told her, not knowing, I suppose, that snakes aren't supposed to talk, but I suppose the assumption for I commentators is that she's so newly created that these laws of nature haven't been established to her yet. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So, naturally, in any relationship, here's what you do, here's what you don't do. Do you choose me, or do you choose an alternative? God doesn't go yonder and eliminate competition. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. There's the lie. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, that your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, no one would buy a lie if it wasn't wrapped in a lot of truth. That's how, sadly, most cults get passed off. 
they have enough of the gospel message to pass off their flawed theology and then use it to get your donations out of you. That's how you know if someone's, well, intentions in revealing to you the truth is just to get down to your wallet or by other means in your life. But Satan being this illustration of, or Scar rather, being an illustration of Satan, we know that him being the current king of this world when he was tempting Jesus in the temptations of Christ when he was called by the Holy Spirit to fast for 40 days to literally be on the verge of death physically so that he could demonstrate by no uncertain means that it was only his spirit only his character that could sustain him in those moments he couldn't white knuckle it he was just skin and bone but when Satan said all the kingdoms of the world belong to me and I give them to whomever I will I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded with God's word and saying, It is written, and he quoted Deuteronomy, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Now, note, Jesus could have quoted other scripture, like the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The work of his hands is not given and posed to anybody. There is one God, there is none after me, and there will be there is none before me. But Jesus didn't bring up this theological debate with Satan. He simply just pointed out there is one God and one worthy of worship. Note, there are others who call themselves figures of authority, term Elohim, but there is one Yahweh. And Jesus was reminding Satan, yes, this world belongs to you. He didn't refute that, but it won't always. And I'm going to put my investment and trust in someone who's going to be in it for the long haul which we'll talk about more in a second. But while on the topic of God and the rightful king returning to his throne, a second example I'd like to point out to you is Mufasa. And Mufasa is a good example of God, but not God entirely. And what do I mean by that? Well, we as Christians believe, if you guys are just listening to this as atheists, you or agnostics, whichever you would call yourself in between, even Muslims are welcome. We believe that God is a trinity. Now, we believe in one God, but that because God is unlike anything else in creation, he is an absolutely unique being, that he expresses himself, his essence, is in three persons. The first would be the Father, the figure of authority in the head over all creation. And passages like John chapter 4 and verse 24 note that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He is not a physical entity. He is an absolute, divine, omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient creator. And that by introducing a physical realm is not bound by its laws. We know that the second member of the Trinity, the Son, the physical manifestation of God's heart and all of creation is fully God, but he is not the Father. We have seen him in history as Jesus Christ and is every much as bit of God as God the Father but the Father is not the Son. And the third member is the Holy Spirit, the spiritual manifestation of God that is capable of interacting with man without the consequences noted to us in books like Numbers and Exodus, where the full power of God's glory in our fallen, crippled, and temporary flesh would be the equivalent of us trying to survive the glory of the Son. We would melt, we would burn, we would not be able to survive his power and majesty. But all these things being pointed out, Mufasa is an example of two out of the three persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Holy Spirit, because we see that just as God is the true king, the one who rightfully owns the title deed to creation, has been separated from his kingdom and is using his son to restore his kingdom and to save his creation. And Again, repeating that verse to you that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We see in the Lion King how Mufasa, even though his body was separate from the rest of his kingdom, that he was still able to rule through a mediator, through that great high priest, through that king that bore in every sense the full biology of who God was in heart, person, and character. Note, they used a flawed example. And no illustration is absolute and perfect, but you understand the point, the breeze, the rush. Rafiki pointed out to Simba, he lives in you. And all of these points being illustrated to us, Mufasa fulfills this role as the father in more senses than biologically to Simba. 
But with Simba also being the topic, we see him as the illustration of the second person in the Trinity. Note, Jesus lived a perfect life. He was entirely sinless. He never had doubts. He never had any struggle with the sinner flesh. He was tempted in all ways as we are, and yet without sin. He was the one who actively demonstrated the combined nature of fallen man in his flesh, capable of facing death, but also being divine in character, could not conflict with his own nature, just like we as human beings are fallen and therefore can't, without a new birth, a new heart, a new spirit, can't and aren't capable of performing anything righteous. Jesus was the exact opposite. He, by nature, couldn't sin, and he demonstrated that when Satan tempted him. But Simba represented this in that Jesus, just like in his relationship with God, Simba was the physical restoration of Mufasa's rule to his kingdom and the hope for a life to continue and remove death's authority, to kick Scar out by the curb and turn him into a throw rug, as Zazu recommended in the Halls of Hercules. Disney film Inception, you guys will follow if you see the two. But we see this actually demonstrated in John 3.16, which will probably be familiar to most of you. But the passage says, For God so loved the world, the Father, that he gave his only begotten Son. The Father sent the Son, that whosoever believes in him, the role of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of its need for a Savior, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And this point being basically illustrated as Simba, representing Jesus, that by his coming to the kingdom, we see and understand an active illustration of how the Bible demonstrates what the reality is concerning the reason why not only our world is in the fallen state that it is, but that the promises that God made aren't too beyond the imagination, because what is a kingdom without its subjects? What is God the Father without saving those that he loves, without giving an opportunity for everyone to come to repentance? He gives chances, but he also respects their choices, and that's why not everyone will be saved. But there are some who will, and that brings us to the fourth example, Timon and Pumbaa. Two favorite characters among the fans of this show. And in the movie we see Timon and Pumbaa, an active illustration of God's people and followers of Jesus. Jacob, whose name means usurper, heel catcher, cheater, manipulator, plays well into the Jewish stereotype that's often given to God's chosen and beloved people in that Timon, that while he has certainly character defects, it doesn't matter because God still loves him. He still cares about him. He's still using him to this day. And the same is also true. Jacob, the Jew, Timon, the meerkat, the weak and the vulnerable, the smallest of all nations, but makes an incredible impact simply because of who his God is. And then also simultaneously the non-Jewish example in the most unkosher thing you could possibly imagine, a pig. If you ask a Jew if he wants a pork sandwich, you've just literally belched at the dinner table because they culturally and ceremoniously have nothing to do with things that are cloven because of the Levitical law of Moses. And again, God had reasons for this. And if you want to find out, we'll be doing a discussion on it soon concerning the law of Moses and why God was giving Israel, in a sense, health laws with good reason because he needed this nation to stand aside and apart by giving them the opportunity to not only know health codes that even preserved them during the Black Plague, let alone keep them from massive outbreaks of leprosy and such, but also to remind them that it's one thing to be told about the germ theory. It's another thing just to say, just trust me, I know more than you. And Israel did. But Pumbaa, in a sense, this boar, this pig, this non-Jewish character, was simply known that even though he had his issues, he was still, he just knew that he was loved. And that's something that we all loved, especially in Lion King one and a half. He's a very favorite character of mine. And both of these individuals, Timon and Pumbaa, were living Hakuna Matata, a life without worry, because of their relationship with Simba. Romans chapter 10 and verse 2. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him. So recognize the illustration that's being put here. Timon and Pumbaa being the ones who actively, in a sense, raised Simba when he was kicked out of his kingdom. In a sense, we see the roles reversed in the reality. 
that because of our relationship with Jesus, non-Jews like myself and the Jewish people, with them as a nation, even though they, for the most part, have rejected God in a sense, that God still loves them, God still provides for them, and God still gives them peace, even in the midst of a world of war. That because they have a lion on their side, predators don't want anything to do with them. And even though we're constantly taking in junk and bugs, that God's still the one who sees us through to the end. He's the one who keeps us safe. But there's also another illustration of the church, the so-called Bride of Christ, because Nala, our fifth example, is actually an illustration of the church as a whole. Now, again, we began the study in the book of Revelation, and I see no sense in not wanting to continue to do so. It's my favorite book of the Bible. But you see Nala as this illustration of the Bride of Christ because she was, in a sense, Simba's reason to return to his kingdom. That after he was separated from it for a time, Simba's uh, bride was brought to him and gave him a reason to return to his people, to retake the kingdom. And we see this in Revelation chapter 19. I recommend you read the whole book of Revelation as well as the entirety of chapter 19, but I'll just read this passage to you for your time's sake. I heard, as it were, John speaking, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, praise the Lord, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb, and we know that's Jesus, has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So who's the lucky girl? It was, and to her, it was granted, note, she didn't earn this, it was given to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen, her dress, this white dress, is the righteous acts of the saints, those who've been set apart, those who've been given white robes of righteousness, those who've been sanctified and set apart for God's kingdom. The bride of Christ is the church and his bride will be with him in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where we'll be spending the seven years of tribulation that the earth will be facing, when in a sense, Scar is given full reign to ravage the earth, and the planet will essentially be in the same state we saw the Lion King towards the last 20 minutes of the movie. Now, verses 11 through 18, of course, are an active illustration, or an active representation, a literal verbatim enunciation of Jesus when he comes to return to rule and reign and kick Scar and the hyenas out. That could be, in a sense, our next example. But for time's sake, I'll just go through these briefly. We see Rafiki as an example of the priesthood, someone who intermediates and is spoken to by God through means that sometimes may not make sense to us. But unlike most shamans, again, the illustration falls apart at some point, but the theme remains the same, someone who intermediates for God's Holy Spirit in man and speaks through him to us. We see Zazu as an illustration of those who have been called to speak for and from God's resources. We see individuals like the 144,000 Jewish anointed. We see the four messengers, the angelic creatures, who will be sharing the gospel during the last half of the tribulation period. The two witnesses who will lead the 144,000 to salvation in Jesus towards the beginning of the tribulation, and as well modern day missionaries today and in times past. All of these examples, people who could be called prophets, those who simply were in some sense and cases not necessarily a prize of themselves, but because of the message that they bore, they bore a very significant title, not because of who they were, but who they represented, not what they said, but who they were saying it to, and whose resources they were saying it from. And at times, you could read this in the Bible for yourself, like the prophets, Isaiah, well, pretty much every Old Testament minor and major prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the like, they weren't always acknowledged, even when they were in the elephant graveyard, See what I did there? But, and all these other things. An eighth example would be the hyenas, those who follow the flesh, or servants of Satan, those who are only ruled by what they want instead of what their true needs are. But all these things being pointed out to us, I want to bring you to the ninth and most important illustration that we're going to talk about today, the circle of life. Now you're probably listening to that song right now. You got the theme, the notes, the African dialect words in your head. You get the idea, but I want to read to you where this term, the circle of life, actually came from. And no, it wasn't about a biological ecosystem. In fact, it's in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. 
Paul speaking to the church in Philippi is talking about Jesus' humility, but I want you to pay attention to the process that Jesus went through concerning his own life. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Absolute, divine, total authority. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, so becoming man. We see the cycle heading in a downward lilt. And humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death and even the death of the cross. Therefore, low point, anyone, death, God, absolute authority, all the way down to becoming man so he's capable of dying and a death so miserable and humiliating as a death in the cross. Verse 9, now therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, the name of God himself, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we see in a sense a revelation of God's nature, that the Father is not in a sense the absolute apex of authority. He glorifies the Son. The Son in all of his actions and in the very essence of his character glorifies the Father. And the Holy Spirit points us to the Son to the glory of the Father. So this triune being in of itself is not even self-serving. The absolute apex of authority is ruled within himself, by himself. Again, mind-blown concepts about God being a triune being, but that's why he's called God and we're called human. Our understanding is limited, but our trust is voluntary. Now, just like Mufasa told Simba, the lions eat the antelope, the beings that are dominant, obviously, they enforce their rule, they're carnivores, but then the lions die, and they become the grass, and those in the low end eat the grass, and they themselves are exalted. Now, we see this also illustrated, not in a sense biologically, but spiritually, that Jesus is God. He began in glory. He became a man, a servant as a man as well. He suffered, he died, and he rose again from the dead and now sits forever on the throne of God as the Lamb who was slain, worthy of all worship, as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords. You can read the rest of chapter 5 if you want to know exactly how they did so, but the point remains. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So from glory to death and back, if you're willing to put your trust in the one who isn't just the inventor of the circle of life, who set this creation in order to be self-sustaining, but also became a living example of it in both body and spirit, you'll become not only a part of the low end in recognizing your sinful separation from God and your need to have a savior, but through faith, and faith alone, which is simply a word that means trust, will give you not only the opportunity to be a part of the circle of life, but eternal life, with no more downsides ever to be experienced again. That's the gospel, and that's the true message of the Lion King. Thank you for your time listening to the study. If you have any questions or would like to know more, about the topics that we've discussed or maybe how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ through sometimes even the most interesting of means like the Lion King and Disney films. Leave them in the comments below. If you have requests about stuff we'd like to talk about more, I'll always meet sincerity with clarity. I'd be more than happy to do the studies. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, you know where to go. But most importantly, if you know someone who perhaps is familiar with the movie but not with the one who founded these concepts, what these illustrations were actually referring to, and perhaps the reason why Lion King can be worth more than just a use of someone's time, please share the study with anyone and everyone that you feel could be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and being a part of how much this study would be a blessing to me. I hope it's been a blessing to you too. And remember, Jesus loves you.